right now. I don't believe that the police should be asked. They should let him go. Let us go. The police should let him go. This is Singapore. Population, 4 million. 3 million of whom are citizens, or Singaporeans. The island republic of Singapore had been called names, like a little red dot, an irritating pimple that refuses to burst, a Disneyland with the death penalty, and more recently, a piece of dried snot. As Singaporeans, however, we would much prefer to be known as the paragon of the modern Asian society. Clean streets, clean water, Clean government, a financial hub, education hub, information and technology hub, a shopper's paradise, a funky town. In Singapore, we like to emphasize the good and disregard the bad. We mostly speak in one voice, and that voice belongs to the PAP, or the People's Action Party. Under its founding father, Lee Kuan Yew, the PAP government has transformed Singapore from a third world country to a first world economy credited largely to Singapore's unique brand of political stability. The PAP have won every general election since 1959. Unlike other autocratic states, the PAP government prides itself in not using oppressive methods to silence their critics. Instead, critics and opponents often shoot themselves in the foot. <laughs> From time to time, they pay fines or charge for income tax evasion, woohoo! Sued for defamation, eventually bankrupted or opting for exile. Of course, they find themselves in jail, and sometimes without trial for as long as 32 years. Over the course of the last 45 years, the PAP government has successfully outmaneuvered, outnumbered, and outlasted their political opponents. Any citizen who engages in political activism against the government might as well be caught with a copy of Playboy magazine or a stick of marijuana. It is perceived as a crime that carries the same social stigma and sometimes a worse penalty. Yet, there are some among us who have chosen to take that treacherous path. The only sensible question we have to ask is, are they crazy? Hey, Dr. Chi. Are these your kids? Are these your kids? Yep, this is the youngest. Uh, do you often bring your kids to the office? Every day. They Every day? Come in. Uh, don't you find it noisy? Does it, it disrupt is, your work? It is, but you know, you, you work around it and somehow make it work. Otherwise, okay. Is, is there another place where we can conduct the interview? Uh, perhaps a quieter place? We have to do it downstairs. I think it's going to be a bit too disruptive to do it over here. All right. <laughs> Say hi. I'd come back to Singapore in 1990 after graduating uh, from the US. Uh, and I had joined the National University of Singapore I was lecturing there uh, in psychology uh, and it was then that uh, I started getting interested in some of the issues, political issues uh, on education for example and that led to my uh, slowly finding out more and more about the political situation in Singapore and then I had gone to um, look for Mr. Cham Si Tong at the time he was uh, an opposition uh, member of parliament, it still is, and expressed my interest in um, joining the opposition. But you know, as with all Singaporeans, I was also very fearful, um, and uh, basically, I just slid a note under his uh, under his door in his office and asked him to contact me in a very uh, private 
manner. Um, and it was this continued uh, um, uh, having to deal with the fear, that I, but somehow began to uh, take the first step, and then taking that first step was over, able to overcome the fear and, and to be able to, to join the opposition. Then. It was 1992, the end of 1992, that uh, by-elections was called for, um, and I had then uh, joined uh, and taken part in that by-elections. And at that time, you could feel a and, and sense of, of Singaporeans' frustrations and anxiety and anger over some of the, the policies that were affecting them. And it was, again, for these people that uh, um, we speak up for and uh, absolutely no regrets and feel that it's very important that um, Singaporeans begin to be able to stand up for themselves um, in the voice, in the form of, of um, an opposition in opposition politics. Now, following the by-elections in 1992, I was sacked by the university. Uh, and my head of department uh, had sacked me, and he was also a PAP MP. Uh, and it was then that I felt very strongly uh, that a statement needed to be made. And I went on a hunger strike, uh, not so much because of my sacking uh, for my own, own, own sake, but more to show how this system cannot continue this way where people, Singaporeans, wanting to speak up and join the opposition continue, uh, continue to be um, persecuted in such a manner. And uh, the best way uh, for me to be able to do that would be to do a personal protest in the form of hunger strike. Obviously my friends and family they were concerned, uh, but again, as I said, it's something that when you feel is necessary you do it. Uh, and I'm sure uh, it was something that uh, they would have understood. No, absolutely no regrets. After my uh, sacking, I, when I disputed the dismissal, um, the head of department, who was also a PAP MP, uh, sued me for defamation. And as a result, um, I ended up having to pay something in the region of about 300,000 US dollars. My wife and I, we had to sell off our, our house and our car um, just to make good the payments, otherwise I would have been declared bankrupt. At the end of 1998, I felt that we had come to the end in terms of what the opposition can and cannot do. Without the freedom of assembly, without the freedom of speech, to be able to engage and communicate with the electorate directly, we were just not going to be able to move ahead. And so at the end of the year, in 1998, I gave a talk, a lunchtime talk, at the Raffles Place. Uh, and a crowd gathered. And I wanted to be able to demonstrate that Singaporeans can come together in a public place to discuss and debate public issues without it degenerating into chaos and anarchy as the uh, government would have us believe. And it was done very successfully and we, we showed it that people could come together and then be able to do this in a very civilized manner. I repeated the uh, talk one week later and that went into 1999. And for both of my, for my efforts, the, I was prosecuted. I think the main feature of the 2001 elections was uh, that encounter that I had with then Prime Minister Go Chok Tong. It was at a Hawker Centre and the PAP and Mr. Go was there. Um, we were there as well and we were of course greatly outnumbered when the PAP started shouting its, its, its slogans and so on. And what I did was then to be able to overcome the noise barrier then I had to, wanted to put my question across to Mr. Go and asked him where's the money? And the money referred to the Indonesian loan that was pledged to the Suharto regime back in 1997. What Mr. Go Chok Tong did, and a lot of Singaporeans don't know about this, is that he pointed to his pocket when I asked him where's the money. Um, but of course, the media being the way that it is, didn't even uh, bring up this point. In any case, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew and then uh, 
Mr. Goh Chok Tong himself then decided to sue me for bringing up that question. Uh, and when I went to court to apply for Queen's Counsel to represent me because I couldn't find any local lawyers, uh, the courts first said that the que first Queen's Counsel that I applied for was unfit to come to Singapore to practice because he had crit criticized the judiciary before. Then when I applied for another Queen's Counsel, the judge now tells me that uh, my case is not complex enough. If it is not complex enough, then why did Mr. Lee and Mr. Goh engage a senior counsel, Singapore's equivalent of Queen's Counsel? So not only do I not, not, have, not have a lawyer, the plaintiffs went to court, applied for summary judgment, which was heard indoors, behind, in chambers. And the registrar, not a high court judge, the registrar then awarded them the case. Okay, what happened in uh, 2002? There were four Muslim schoolgirls whose parents wanted them to wear their headscarves to school. And based on that, the Ministry of Education banned them. And so it was a situation that needed to be addressed, at least debated, brought up in the open. You don't need to suppress such views because the debate can be very healthy. I brought this up. I went to the uh, speaker's corner, was accused of uh, speaking on a religious topic and uh, very promptly then prosecuted and fined. Following that, uh, on May the 1st, where the entire world was commemorating May Day, millions of workers in cities all across the world were holding rallies and talks and so on and so forth. I felt that given the occasion, Singaporean workers, their interests, their rights should be addressed as well. Um, we're going to set up, uh, probably have a rally around this area here. So we're going to set up some of our uh, the exhibits uh, around this area. Singapore finding it tremendously difficult to make it, and yet they don't have a voice. We want to tell everybody, Singaporeans as well as everybody else in the world, that in this day and age of an independent labor movement that will speak up on it for the rights of workers uh, is crucial. And that is going to be just as important. All the other factors are pushing on the economy forward. I'll have a lot more to say later on when I uh, during our, our rally and our speech. And, uh, that's just way too long. I'm just going to be bringing the props down and, and just uh, exhibits and so on. Yes. I'll be selling my uh, uh, report and our books and so on. Uh, no, well, I mean, our intention is basically to have a uh, peaceful rally here. Uh, we hope the police will cooperate. This is the right of every Singaporean to be able to organize uh, freely, speak freely in this country. And I've mentioned that this is all enshrined in our constitution. So I honestly hope that the police will cooperate and respect the rights of all the people. Yes, sir.
to the um, uh, investigating officers um, office and where we were questioned and uh, meanwhile there were some of our, our supporters in the, the waiting area uh, of the police station and they were also told to leave when they had every right to be there I was an assistant superintendent of, of uh, the police uh, in my uh, national service as a, as a reservist police officers must know that people involved with the opposition wanting the democratic rights are as Singaporean as any other person uh, in this country. And they must understand that we're not out to create trouble. What we need to do is to continue to speak up because this is what is going to be good for Singapore in the long run. Classic uh, case of uh, police state that uh, Singapore is. I was charged for speaking without a permit and because that was not the, my first uh, charge, I was uh, fined and when I refused to pay the fine was sentenced to five weeks imprisonment uh, in lieu of the, the fine. Uh, prison in Singapore is very harsh. You're put in a small cell, in a lockup cell with couple of other inmates and you're basically entombed in there for 24 hours you're given 45 minutes a day to for your exercise and to wash up and so on it really grates on the mind are you prepared to defy the law then oh yeah i don't i don't think this would be last time i'm going to back here why do you constantly get into trouble with the law all the time when you say law one must be able to distinguish between just laws and unjust laws. Just laws are laws that are good for society and they must be respected and obeyed. Unjust laws are the ones that are put in place by governments to suppress the people and to buttress their own power. It is the unjust laws 
that we must bring to the attention of citizens. And the only way that we can begin to do that is to break these laws. But when you break these laws, you must be prepared to face the consequences and not run away. The Mahatma Gandhi, if you take a look at the folder, turn to the back, you look at what quote they would put in there. He said, democracy is a state in which people cannot act like sheep. Now I've been to Australia and I've seen how sheep behave. And it is remarkable that these individual animals, when they're in a flock, they behave with such precision and such coordination. I think the NDP parade would be proud to have them with one of its contingents. After all, they're in all the white. <laughs> But in order to be able to get that kind of behavior, for this flock to be able to move the way it does, you need three things, three factors. One, there must be fear. Two, you must deprive the individual animal of information. It must keep its head down and not look up. You must make sure that those that step out of line are quickly punished. And of course, it helps to have a bunch of running dogs all around. <laughs> the question is, my friends, are we sheep? Now, Dr. Chi, you are a politician. Are you not concerned with losing popularity with the people? Everyone, every individual wants to and has a need for popularity, to want to be popular. But in a situation such as Singapore, where you are faced with this close society, it is important to be able to do the right thing rather than the popular thing. Uh, Mr. J.B. Jaranam, you will say that Singaporeans are too materialistic, are only concerned with money. Why do you then bother to fight for their democratic freedoms? Well, I should have thought uh, it's when people become too materialistic, you've got to remind them that there are other things in life besides acquiring wealth and goods and materials. Well, I couldn't agree more with what Mr. Jaranam has just said, but I would like to add one point. The Singaporeans forget that without democratic freedom, they will always be at the mercy of the ruling party, at the go of the government. And when that happens, as it is happening right now, uh, their economic rights are going to be curtailed, their right to be able to have, say, minimum wage, or to be entitled to some uh, benefits when they are retrenched without any fault of their own. These are all problems that can be uh, um, helped when they have their political rights. What about you yourself? Would it be easier for you to just move abroad? and not bother about politics and just enjoy the good life with your family? Why bother fighting for Singapore's freedom? Well, that, that's just the, the, the cowardly way out. Uh, I, I think it's important for me to continue to be able to stay because when I leave, all it means is that PAP wins. And when the PAP wins, the people lose. You cannot have that scenario. Father of Singapore has called you a congenital liar, political gangster, and a cheat. How do you think that will affect uh, you or your 
family or your kids in the future? No, I think it's as far as, as my family is concerned, they know. But my, my kids, of course, are still young. But when they grow up, they'll know what their father has done, what he's doing, what he stands for, his values. And uh, I'm sure they'll, they'll know what the truth is. It doesn't matter what Lee Kuan Yew, what names Lee Kuan Yew labels, puts, uh, calls people and his opponents. Um, they'll see for themselves now.